right, so now we're going to move on to a, a panel structure where we have two uh, speakers who are going to speak for about 15 minutes on scientific opportunities and challenges in studying precursory phenomena. After each talk, there's going to be five minutes for questions for about that individual talk, and then 10 minutes for discussion after that. And so we're going to start with uh, Sergio Ruiz from the University of Chile. Uh, Sergio, are you there? Yes, I am here. Good morning. Oh, terrific. Thank you. So Sergio is going to be um, talking about some precursory slow slip signatures in Chilean subduction. So Sergio, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for this invitation to show some the precursors that we are observing in the Chilean subduction. Um, here is my presentation. Uh, see you my my presentation? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Great. My presentation is uh, mostly about the Kiki Arc, the, the event that was previously introduced by Emily. And also an earthquake that happened in central Chile was on a smaller than Iquique, was on magnitude 6.9. But also uh, this event has some uh, for some uh, clear uh, precursor. Um, in general in Chile, uh, mostly of the large earthquake that happens in the mega trust in the contact between uh, Nazca and South America are preceded by fortune. For example, when we read the historical events we read from. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it's only uh, like an anecdote. Uh, uh, the event that happened in 1730, this large event that happened in central Chile, an event magnitude 9. And in this period, this event was very destructive, but fortunately, uh, almost any person died. Why? <laughs> because when the earthquake uh, occurred, uh, mostly of the people was sleeping in the garden because previous to this uh, large earthquake uh, in central Chile were many fortunes and at this time the seismic culture for the Chilean people was that when there is uh, swarms of the large events could be happened a uh, bigger event and in general for us, mostly of the events that happen in the mega trust has workshops, but one of the problems that I mentioned is uh, in Chile the most destructive events that happen inside Nazca Plate, it's uh, around 100 kilometers, and as apparently these events, we don't observe some uh, fortunes. Okay, if we see other uh, in the last uh, years, in Chile, we have recorded several events, but our network is working relatively well only in the last few years. And for example, during the Mauler, an event 818, also was recorded some a small fortune. <coughs> but at this time, our network is not uh, well, then we are not sure this. Uh, Big earthquake was preceded by some clear swarm of events. There is only one idea that some events preceded this uh, large earthquake. Iquique was well recorded, that was introduced by Emily, and I speak uh, after. And uh, other two earthquakes, like, like Iyapel, that was an event magnitude 8.3. In the zone that happened, that is in northern central Chile, there is no many uh, stations close. Then there is not clear fortune because of this event. Also, the same problem we have for Chiloé event. And Valparaiso was a smaller event, but fortunately we have some stations just in front of the epicenter of this earthquake. And recently happened other interplate intermediate death earthquake that was uh, some destruction in the in the cities are close, but we don't observe uh, fortune probably because it's the this kind of event is a different that, that happens in the mega thrust. Okay, Iquique happened in the northern Chile, was a, was an, we, we expect this event because the largest that happened more than 100 years ago was an event probably magnitude 9 with a large tsunami. 
And for many times, there is not big earthquake in all this zone that is around 500 kilometers. But uh, like Emily introduced, this earthquake was uh, clear four shocks two weeks before. But I, I can show this observation. Uh, I don't have a physical interpretation of what, but I think that it's very interesting that the Iquique earthquake occur here. And if we observe the, these, uh, these dots are the epicenters of event magnitude larger than six, we can see that uh, mostly of the interplate event uh, occur in the last uh, 10 years or after 2005. And what happened in 2005? 2005, we, we have an, a, an added interplate intermediate death earthquake that happened in front of Iquique. It was Tarapacá event. That this is the, um, the epicenter. It was on a magnitude 6.8. It happened uh, 100 kilometer depth. And after this uh, interplate intermediate death earthquake, if we observe uh, time series that we have in, in Kiki City, in, in this point, then in front of uh, after Iquique earthquake, if we can see the time series, we can see that before of Trapaca, that is a blue line, for example, for the east-west movement of this uh, GPS anthem, we have some trend. Here's, unfortunately, there is a gap in the data. But after of 2005, in, in this zone, in, in Iquique, the movement of the GPS uh, changed his, uh, his velocity. There is a change in the trend that we think that happened because occurred this event in 2005. That is here, it's an intraplane intermediate effort. And this uh, introduced some change in the, in the coupling of the megatrust or, or some physical things that at the moment, I think we don't understand well that happened. But this, this is the observation. Also, this uh, increased the event magnitude 6 at this uh, period of time. Also, at this moment, we can start in 2005. We record many, many swarms that happened in the boundaries of the, the rupture of Iquique earthquake. This star, this uh, swarm, start to detect it around 2005. Uh, some people like Kato look in these swarms by the repeating events. There is many repeating events during several years before of the Kike airport. And also we, we, we observe that this star around 2007, 2005. But here the problem is at this period, also start the instrumentation. Then here I am not sure that uh, the observation of the swarms is really a star after the interplate uh, intermediate effort. Anyway, uh, we have this observation. Uh, also, Ansoquet study the GPS time series, and she and her groups they propose that an a slow sleep event start at least eight months before. And like uh, Emily chose, we propose that also an slow basic event uh, increase his movement two weeks before of the GK. Then for, this is for Ikike, there is clear four shocks two weeks before, probably an slow basic event also occurred two weeks before and maybe his star previously, for example, and Soket proposed that this is this is star, uh, this movement star, eight months before, and probably also happened after a uh, Tarapaca earthquake was in 2005. The other observation that uh, I can show you is an event for us, for the subduction event, maybe not so big. It's an, Event magnitude 6.9 that happened in, in central Chile, it's Valparaiso, this is Santiago, that's our capital, and there is uh, many seismicity in this zone. And in this case, we have here in this picture, maybe it's not very good, but we have these uh, inverted triangles 
are the stations, broadband and some GPS station. And then, for example, here we have an, also a GPS station. All these uh, red dots are the foreshocks and the aftershocks of this uh, airport. And in this case, only two days before of a uh, main shock that was a magnitude 6.9, occurred an event magnitude 8.4. And during two days, we have uh, many events, magnitude larger around five, then we have an, an swarms of the event magnitude uh, five. That, uh, that if we look in this picture, this is the, the period of time, here happens the main shock, these are two days of seismicity, and the, the dots are the, are the events, but the blue square are the repeating events. Then we look for the repeating, and we observe that the two days before, many of these four shocks also has the criteria of the repeater's event. But also, like I mentioned to you, ah, also we, we look of this event, where they happen, then we study this, uh, this uh, tensor moment, and we think that mostly happened in the, in the interface between uh, Nazca Plate and South America. And also, uh, here in front of all this seismicity, we have a uh, GPS station, and if we look at the time series of this GPS station, this is, this is uh, our days, this is from 1st of January, and here are the, the two days before we observe that the, the GPS st station start to move. Here occur the, the co-seismic, this is the main shock. And this also, we think that maybe this was a an, uh, an slow slip that happened during these two days before of the main shock. Here is a, a zoom of this zone, but here is the uh, movement that is around uh, 10 millimeters. Here we have the, this is the previous movement, the movement that happened in the GPS station two days before. And if we did an inversion for, for interpreting this uh, nucleation phase, this uh, two days, we, we have that the, the slip that uh, reproduced the, the movement in the GPS station is equivalent to a seismic moment of around 6.5, 6.6. And the largest foreshock that we recorded during these two days was only a 5.9. Then mostly of the movement that we need to, to, interpret, in, to do an interpretation of this uh, movement should be uh, a seismic. Well, after we did uh, the, the, the sleeping version for the main shock, and well, this is a dynamic inversion, but it's not many here. And then in this summary picture, I, I show you the events that was uh, repeating events that happened during the four shock sequence. Then these are events that happened the two days before of the main shock. The, the rupture of the main shock is this, um, this gray zone. And this continuous light could be the a seismic moment that we, uh, we obtain considering the movement of the GPS station during these two days previous to the main shock of the Valparaiso airport. And then, um, and summary and other ideas of these uh, earthquakes. Well, we have uh, two events at least that we think that uh, has clear precursors. They are has clear uh, foreshocks and some swarms that, and these swarms that also are repeater events. And probably in both case, Iquique and Valparaiso, this movement was associated to a slow sleep. Also for other earthquakes that I mentioned, for example, Maule earthquake or others, we don't have very clear fortunes, probably because our magnitude completeness is not enough at this moment. It's uh, in Chile at this moment, the completeness magnitude is around three. Some years ago, if we are around four. Then like Emily uh, said, 
I think that at this moment we need to reinterpret the, the data and looking for maybe for four shocks that could be happen before others earthquake, but with the lower magnitude uh, looking using the uh, matching learning matching uh, techniques. Uh, and so far, I think that we are not studying well, at least for the Chilean earthquake, the intrapay intermediate death events. These are more the most destructive in, in Chile. And we don't, we are not observed and clear a precursor phase for this uh, event. The, the most clear, like I mentioned, is always, is always for the events that happened in the, in the mega thrust. And the other problem in Chile for the precursors is, here is uh, in Chile we have many swarms, but uh, probably now we are in the identified uh, also slow sleep events. But many of these swarms, after they don't continue with a large effort. Okay, thank you. If you have any question, please. Thank you very much, Sergio. That was perfectly timed. My alarm was about to go Thank off you. at 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliantly done. Um, do you have any questions? We have five minutes. Okay, I'll ask a question. I mean, Sergio, this is really a remarkable set of observations that you've just um, summarized prior to multiple earthquakes in Chile. I mean, there's no denying the, you know, the, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to put it, but the potential here in terms of seeing processes that are clearly going on before large magnitude earthquakes. I wonder what the reaction is in Chile, as you heard Emily talking about observational capabilities to try and understand these um, observations better. I wonder within Chile, what is the discussion like um, in terms of putting out instrumentation to be able to make more observations like this potentially in the future? Yes, I think that I obviously I share the idea that deploy um, that we need a station uh, below of the uh, on shore in the in the ocean here. But also at this moment in Chile, we have not a good uh, a good uh, network in many places. For example, in Yapel Airport that was an event 2015. We don't have a, a seismological station close the rupture zone. Then in this zone, the magnitude completeness, for example, I think is a magnitude around 3.5 and with some more stations in close to this uh, rupture zone, I think that we can take a lower magnitude, completeness magnitude, and then maybe there is some fortune magnitude uh, two or, or any so, any something. Then we are, at this moment in Chile, we have, uh, I think, a, a good network, but the purity is uh, to do a more uniform in the space or land stations. <coughs> okay, thank, thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one quick more, <clears throat> one other question. We have a call out to Anne Sokay, who's actually here, by coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you want to add anything? Um, well, uh, yeah, th uh, Sergio, thank you very much for your uh, <coughs> talk and review. Uh, I was, uh, maybe we can point something out that uh, has been... Maybe yes. move a little closer to you, just so he can hear you really well. Thank you very much, Sergio, for your uh, review. Um, so we can probably point something that uh, has been seen in Chile. It's that uh, interaction between earthquakes. So you mentioned the interaction between Tarapaca slab pool earthquake and Iquique, slab, uh, and Iquique megatrust earthquake. But um, uh, you, you've shown also that uh, there are uh, large-scale uh, transient deformation after Maole earthquake that cannot be um, successfully uh, modeled by post-seismic uh, viscoelastic relaxation. Yes. And um, so this uh, was compatible with an increase in geodetic coupling 
before Iliapel earthquake. So this is something that is very intriguing and that is something that we do not uh, really understand. And uh, so other studies have shown that uh, there are large scale interaction between seismicity, so uh, uh, namely an increase in deep seismicity before Iliapel earthquake that started exactly at the time of uh, Ikike earthquake. So uh, this is something that I think we should probably tackle as a community. Uh, the fact that we have um, several uh, earthquakes that are occurring on one given subduction zones. And so I think that probably it's not only uh, focusing on our short term precursor, but uh, probably over a, a wider uh, time scale, try to understand what are the relationships and the measurements uh, that we can uh, do uh, to look at uh, evolution of coupling, long-term evolution of coupling, and long-term evolution of uh, seismicity. So wh what do you think about this, uh, Sergio? Yes, no, uh, thank you, Anne, for, um, for, for your comment. Yes, uh, we also observe, like uh, Anne said, after of Mauler, it was a mega thrust event, that the 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 velocity the trend velocity in the gps change at very long distance of the of the rupture zone and for example iapel earthquake that i mentioned before maybe i have not uh, a good map yes mold happened here and we observe that the GPS changed his uh, velocity trend in a zone that happened here. These are distant are 400 kilometers. And the velocity trend changed exactly in the zone that after occurred the, the Yapel earthquake. Then also, I agree, we think that the Maul earthquake produced um, probably a viscoelastic uh, relaxation at very far distance. And probably IAPL, that was an event magnitude I can see, like, uh, probably this distance, is uh, related with the Mauler. We also, after, uh, propose the same for other events that happened in the southern Chile, was a Chile event and magnitude 7.16, because also Mauler uh, changed the, the velocity or the, the coupling in the, in the southern Chile. Yes, I think that is a, it's a, also, I think that is a very good, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting observation that now we, we need to understand and we model uh, well to really understand that happened in the subduction zone when the mega trust earthquake occurred. All right, thank you so much, Sergio. And, and, um, and we're gonna move on now. There's another question, but it can, it can I think wait until our, our, our more general panel discussion. So Paul Segal, thank you so much for being here also. Paul is gonna talk about long-term transient deformation prior to the 2011 magnitude nine Tohoku earthquake. Okay, so uh, first off, I don't think this is a precursor what I'm about to talk about, at least in the traditional sense. So presumably I'm here because someone thought so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've spent a long time, and I'll explain why, but I've spent you know, now quite a few years trying to even convince myself that this, what I'm about to show you, is actually real. It is the ground doing something, the earth doing something, and not an artifact. So, and actually, this comes at a good time because it's been on my mind that this was a good time to go back and revisit some of the, thing, the assumptions. So, this is work uh, in the Tohoku region that Emily already spoke about. It doesn't seem to be working. Um, oh, no, pointer. Look. We're going to go back. Anyway, that's okay. Uh, so this is in uh, coming from the GeoNet data, the GPS continuous network in Japan, northern Japan, looking at data prior to the earthquake. And um, 
I want to say that that um, that we didn't start out to study pictures three deformation. We were sort of dragged into this by the data. We've just been trying to follow the data since uh, since I discovered this. So I, I just want to walk you through the evidence and what we've done more recently to try to to go back and check. So. I was going to give a talk at the AGU meeting, the year of the earthquake, on something about inverse problems, no spaces, things like that. But I needed the time series, and when I plotted the time series on my screen, I just looked at this and went, wait a minute, this is not straight. There's curvature in these time series. And I just remember holding up a piece of paper against my computer screen and saying, hmm, what's going on here? So I immediately wrote to my colleagues in Japan, and they said, well, we kind of know about this. Um, and the first thing you want to do is to say, is this present in all of the stations? And it's not. You go to stable parts of Japan, the most stable parts of Japan. Uh, in Southwest Japan, they show a pretty linear trend. Uh, the next question is, is this a processing artifact? And, and there's reasons for thinking that it could be because of the way the um, Ge Geographical Survey Institute of Japan was doing their solutions. They were doing solutions in subnetworks and then combining those subnetworks. And you can imagine that if there were stations dropping out in the backbone network that they used to tie them together, that you could get artifacts. So really worried about that quite a bit and talked to colleagues at JPL who were doing independent processing using what's called point, precise point positioning, which is you don't need these subnetworks. And we were able to see their results, but not publish them. And we found that we, we analyzed those data, but not published them. And we found that, yes, we could see the same kind of thing. So we knew it wasn't completely an artifact of the processing. Although I'll show you that there's probably some component of that in there. And then there are transits. There are a lot of magnitude six and a half and larger earthquakes in this area during this time period, which starts in 1996 when the continuous network got more or less complete, or got going. And you can see some of these transients here. So you have to worry about these transients and take them out. Um, so some of this is due to the, to the uh, known transient behavior, but not all of it. And I will say, I'm gonna come back to this, but there's something interesting about this area in general, and that is that the post-seismic transients for these modest earthquakes are very large. And whether that's something that's geographic that has to do, there's something about this area that's different, or whether it's a temporal change that didn't look like this 200 years ago, I don't know. Anyway, so this is what got us started, and this was the part of the thesis, what was the thesis work of Andreas Makamotis. And so what Andreas did is to take these data, we did a reference frame correction the best we could, this sort of state-of-the-art way of correcting for the reference frame in the GeoNet data. I can go into details. Uh, and then he did two things. So normally we fit the time series, these are position time series with a linear term. He just added a quadratic term because you can sort of see there's, there's some curvature in these. And importantly, that curvature starts before the first earthquake. These vertical lines are the earthquakes, the magnitude six and a half and greater earthquakes. The first one was in 2003. And we went through a whole procedure which is pretty complicated to try to remove these post seismic transients. You see them here, and what you're left with is this residual. It actually fits a, uh, a quadratic pretty well. And the interesting thing is that these are statistically significant curvature. And we don't believe that there's a constant acceleration that was going on for hundreds of years. That makes no sense. But during the time period from 96 on up to 2010, it really fits this kind of constant acceleration model. And so we ended up just plotting acceleration vectors. Normally you see velocity vectors. This is the second time derivative of the position time series. And they're spatially coherent. So it's not just one station or two stations, but a lot of stations that are exhibiting this. And in the Tohoku region, that acceleration is trenchward, which is consistent with an increase in slip on in the plate interface. Up in the San Rico area here, there are the opposite sign, which is a, um, a, a decrease in slip rate. And some of these, as I mentioned, some of these accelerations are statistically significant at high level. So we think we know what's going on in the San Rico area. There was an earthquake here in 1994 called the San Rico Oki earthquake. 
And we think that this is one seismic transient from that earthquake. In fact, it's a famous uh, nature paper by Hecke. This is the first time we had continuous GPS data showing a plus seismic transient. What was remarkable about this is that the afterslip, presumably this is mostly afterslip, in the year after the earthquake was comparable to the, to the displacement during the co-seismic phase itself. So that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of post-seismic deformation. It's interesting if you fit, Hecke fit this to a logarithmic function. If you just take his fit and extend it out another 15 years, actually, it's actually made reasonably well. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, so we're pretty confident that that's a post-seismic transient. We actually asked the question, can we explain this data as post-seismic transients? We went through all the large earthquakes that occurred in Japan in the last 100 years use viscoelastic models to see if we could come up with some way of making this signal. And there's only one earthquake that even has the right sign, and that's the Nigata earthquake over here, that's 1966. And so the predicted amplitude is much too small. So we eventually concluded that this residual acceleration here is probably the fact that we didn't fully correct out for San Riku, but this part here is unexplained. Now, I'm going to show you an inversion. Oh, first of all, I wanted to show you. So this is a traditional velocity vector. So in a, in a North American uh, fixed reference frame, you can see you've got convergence towards, uh, away from the trend. So this is compression, and this is opposite in sign. So whether you believe the inversions or not, the, I think this is, this is well. And if you just take the vertical gradient in velocity in 96, at the start of the time series, near 2010, 11 just before the earthquake, there's a 30% difference in the gradient and velocity. That's a 30% difference in spring rate. So that's significant. Um, if you ascribe the acceleration to accelerating slip on the plate interface, you can do an inversion. And the way Andreas did this was to do a so-called minimum norm inversion. So the idea was we try to put the least acceleration possible on the plate interface. This is slip acceleration to explain the data. Now, I want to say that there's nothing necessarily that causes the signal to be on the plate in the face. There is a weak correlation, which if I go back, there's a weak correlation between velocity and acceleration. So that sort of suggests they're coming from the same effect. But if you assert that it's due to acceleration on the plate interface, you're left with uh, this sort of pattern here, deceleration in the north, we think we understand that, this apparent acceleration here, which has this in units and millimeters here squared. Um, I don't believe this is a precursor in the traditional sense, and it doesn't look anything like a nucleation phase. It's spread over this huge area. There's no evidence that it localized towards the initial hypocenter. And it's still going on at this constant rate. It's not accelerating as you go. It's constant acceleration, but it's not like models we have for how things behave on frictional faults where things just ramp up as you go into the earthquake. So there's something going on, we think, but I don't think it's a precursor in the traditional sense. It is true that if this is the right interpretation, that faster slip here would increase the stress where the hypersonic was. So it may have incidentally accelerated the occurrence of the event, but I don't think it's a, a nucleation phase. So we're sort of stuck with that, and then the question is, well, can we find some independent evidence? It was actually, you know, this is the home of repeating earthquakes here at Berkeley, and, and Roland had been working with the Chita-san, who has a, a, had a network, a, sort of a, a catalog of repeating earthquakes, Roland suggested, Maybe we would look at that. And so the idea is that these repeating earthquakes are supposed to be failure of asperity over time. And so if the slip rate is accelerating, then the recurrence time between these earthquakes should get shorter. If it's decelerating, then the recurrence time should get longer. So Andreas took the catalog of Uchida, he went through and had a lot of selection criteria, <clears throat> winnowed it down by more than a factor of 10 to get a certain number of events that had uh, criteria that you know, stable magnitudes, things like that, above the threshold, well above the threshold. And then he applied something called the Mann-Kendall test, which looks for um, monotonic changes. In this case, we're looking for monotonic changes in the recurrence intervals. So here's a case where the recurrence intervals are getting longer. Here's a case where the recurrence intervals are getting shorter. So he just took all these events that met the threshold and then 
uh, plotted them in space, and this is really a remarkable result. All the ones that fit the criterion that had decreasing recurrence intervals were in this area where GPS says that was accelerating. And all the ones that had increasing recurrence intervals were in the area where GPS said this was slowing down. And that's, I think, a pretty compelling result because they're completely independent data sets. Now, you can also take that, that uh, data and try to estimate slip and then slip velocity and slip acceleration in those repeating events. I won't show you that because it's model dependent, but he did that. And then you could do joint inversions on the repeating earthquakes and the, uh, and the GPS statement that's shown here on the right. But that is model dependent. So in the meantime, uh, we've been sort of thinking about, well, what could possibly explain this data? And due to time limitations, I can't really go into the details, but we have this idea that it's possible that so-called seismic asperities are actually shrinking mechanically over time. That is, if dynamic ruptures extend into nominally stable parts of the fault, then interseismically you would expect them to creep, uh, reducing the area of the lock uh, asperity. And Kai Johnson's been working on this. And if you assert that that's the correct interpretation, this is showing the velocities and the lock zones in dark here in 1998 at the velocity field. This is a different velocity field because the acceleration, you could see these disparities would have to shrink a lot. So much so that it alarms me. And I think, you know, we make this fit the data, but do we really believe that that's true? Uh, I was just in Japan in March and ended up visiting um, my colleague Takeshi Suki at Nagoya University. It turns out he had a master's student who went back and looked at this data from scratch all the way from the beginning completely independently. And he did uh, these PPP solutions, these precise point position solutions with modern orbits, modern uh, clocks, earth orientation parameters, and so forth. And he did find a discrepancy with uh, the GSI F3 solution. It's not huge, but let's see. His, the F3, these are the, the ones that we were using are shown in red is more modern solutions shown in blue. And so they're largely similar, but you can see there are differences. He, if you turn that into accelerations, you can see that same pattern is here. So it's, it's the acceleration is landward here, it's transferred there. So it's kind of reassuring, it gets the same pattern. The amplitude is reduced and that's nice. Also his solutions are accurate enough that he can get acceleration in the vertical component. Ours were too noisy to get acceleration in the vertical. So I think this is you know, comforting in that it looks like completely independent analysis. Oh, and by the way, he had to go through a separate way of removing the post-seismic slip from all the six and a half and sevens, although it's largely the same as what we've done. Um, so completely independent analysis is showing something that's very similar, although the amplitude is reduced. And that's good because maybe then the shrinking asperity ID won't be so extreme that it causes me discomfort. I've been working with Camilla Catania, and uh, we have a better understanding, I think a much better mechanical understanding of how these repeating earthquakes work. And I asked Camilla if she would uh, take a, a relook at the uh, repeating earthquakes in the Cheetahs catalog. And she's using, looking at more events, and she realized that you don't have to just restrict to be as restrictive as Andreas was. Uh, this is all based on the fact that the recurrence in interval scales with the moment to the one six power instead of the standard one third power falls. That's all I'm just doing on this. Uh, and the plate velocity. But if you want to look at acceleration, you can just take pairs of earthquakes and get the relative acceleration scaled by whatever the background velocity is, the creep rate. So, in the way she did it, she took this sort of plate velocity of 80 millimeters per year. But you can see her solutions largely look like the Andreas. So again, a completely independent look at the repeating earthquakes uh, gets us more or less to the same spot. And I think this is the end. I just want to say these other relevant observations. Emily talked about the pressure gauge data. I, I just emphasize again that there's just a lot of after slip for these earthquakes. It looks more like the creeping zone of the San Andreas than it does like most other faults that I'm aware of. And the other thing is this magnitude 7.3 foreshock. This is something Jeff McGuire and Shinichi Miyazaki and I looked at. It was just an enormous amount of post-seismic deformation in the time between the foreshock 
and the uh, main shock. So there are just things that are unusual about this area. And again, whether this is something special geographically about the materials and the faults on there, or whether this is some characteristic behavior that changed, I don't know what it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions for Paul, and then we'll go to uh, 10 minutes of panel questions. Paul, oh, it's curious that that reanalysis would introduce such a diminishing of a long-term feature. Can you then expect to see that also in areas where you didn't see those long-term rate changes? Like why would a new GPS analysis produce the cable Patterns in it's, it's the same signal that we were saying, right? But it's diminished, right? It's diminished, right? Because the, so if you look at his, he did a, a pretty careful comparison of the F3 solutions with his solutions, and there are systematic differences, and some of that shows up looking like the curvature. And I think what probably was going on, like. Yeah, but as this was going on is that these some networks are actually moving with respect to one another. They weren't as stable as, as GSI thought. But he, uh, and, and he, well, he did do something where he took an independent network in Europe and did the same analysis and showed that this, this difference didn't show up. So there's something about the way the Japanese were, were yeah. analyzing the data. Actually, we've been also registering oh, the data. I should say. So we have been doing like um, a complete reanalysis of the GPS data in, in, in Japan using a double difference approach. So it's another uh, independent analysis. And we also find this acceleration, which is also diminished. And I think uh, that it's not straightforward to match yourself into a good reference frame in Japan. Because everything in Japan is moving. So when you come to the geometric point of view, you need to establish a good reference frame. And this is not completely straightforward. So, so I think it would be worth actually to compare the different time series issued from the different analyzers. And also, depending on the way you actually correct for the co and post seismic yes. uh, information uh, on individual time series, then you will find. An increased or decreased amount of um, uh, slow, long term series. Yeah, and this is, yeah, really model dependent. So if you use a model that is not too complicated, then you, you find it. But if you, if you overfit the data and put everything in the first seismic signal, then you don't find it anymore. Yeah, so two good points. I'm sorry, I, I should have mentioned uh, Anne and her uh, student Lou. We're just down at Stanford and realize that they're actually doing a reanalysis as well. So now we have three independent analyses of this. And the goal is to kind of very carefully look at all of them. Uh, I think with uh, the global orbits that are determined using stations outside of Japan, and I can't verify for sure that that's what we use, but I think that's true. Uh, then the reference frame should be okay. And you're right, the, you have to be careful how you remove the post seismic transients, but you could see the curvature before the first earthquake. That's the one thing that gives me confidence that this is not due just to somehow how we're taking out the transients from the magnitude sixes. If we didn't see that before the first event, I would worry much more about it. But we were also very careful, uh, and is correct, that if you throw in enough parameters for the post seismic, then you could take out a lot more. We used a physics-based model to tell us which stations should be affected by the post seismic transients with a little bit too much detail. Yeah. Um, assuming this is correct, uh, could you go one step further and break up your time series and see whether there's any spatial trend? We looked for it. I, you know, we looked to see, did it propagate? Was there any evidence it started in the south and propagated in the north or start deep and propagate? We just can't, couldn't convince ourselves we could see any propagation. Um, one thing that uh, Takeshi and I are proposing to do um, 
So, you know, the assumption is that the end of the time series is the anomaly. But since that's a constant rate of curvature, you don't know that. So one thing we're planning to do is to go back and look at all the, the terrestrial classical data. <coughs> and there's a century of data. And see, does that data look more like the early part of the GPS time series or more like the later part of the GPS time series or neither? So we'd like to establish, you know, which is the, which is what's normal. <laughs> Is well, it's accelerating into the earthquake, but we can say that. Right. Thank you very much. We we have now uh, maybe five minutes for for uh, questions for either speaker and, and general discussion. But I want to start. Matt had a question that I uh, didn't have time for after Sergio's talk. So Matt, do you want to go first with your question? Is he there? Sorry, I just got unmuted. I think. Can you guys okay. hear me? Yep. Right, so my question was for Sergio, so I don't know if he needs to be unmuted too, but um, <laughs> I guess my, my question is really just um, thinking about one of the, the motivations for having this meeting, which is sort of thinking about the, the public response and um, emergency management. And I guess I'm curious to know from Sergio, because I remember from the 2014 event, reading media reports about what the public's reaction was to the series of four shocks within the seismic gap and being very concerned. I guess, um, I don't know what happened before the Valparaiso earthquake, but I think in general, I'm just curious with these examples under your belt, um, you know, what do you think about in terms of issuing uh, public warnings or statements about when we start to see a swarm, do we uh, issue a statement or not? Or how, you know, how do we go about making that decision? Sure. Uh, yes, uh, I, I am here. Yes, for 2014 was uh, was uh, I don't know. It's expected that a large magnitude earthquake occur, but even we was to deploy a more seismological station before of a, of the main shock. But for the people, for the management, we are very. Um, we have uh, we have we never did that the earthquake uh, could be occur after the swarms because in chile we have uh, many swarms we have very regular swarms and when this uh, happened the people is uh, very worried because a large magnitude earthquake occur then in general the, the chilean seismologists that when happened the swarms we try to say to, to explain to the um, to the the, uh, the persons that the it's not necessary an earthquake can occur because there is uh, swarms in Chile. It's a, it's a, there is not an um, an public politic in Chile about this uh, that happen when these uh, swarms occur. Only we try to to do the the, pop, the population in, in the in a quite a uh, situation. Are there, are there other questions for either, either speaker? Yes, person. Sergio, so, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on the ongoing seafloor deployments that are happening right now off, off the coast of Chile and how they might uh, feature in future efforts. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, the was, uh, there's there's a couple of groups working on seafloor instrumentation in in yes. Chile right now, and I wonder, sort of moving forward, which parts of the the problem do you think those will help with? I mean, they're they're not continuous, from what I understand. So you can sort of guess what some of the answers are, but I wonder, are are they going to help? Are they going to help with completeness, even if they're not continuous? Are they going to help with the monitoring? Yes, at this moment there is some uh, onshore deployment in the northern Chile, but the German people and also um, the group, the Antrejo and San Diego University, did a deployment in, in, in on other zones of Chile. But uh, at this moment we don't have many results about these uh, deployments. I think that, uh, yes, uh, of course, with this deployment we can know better which the marine structure of a uh, Chilean subduction that we, at this moment we don't know very well. Uh, and also uh, what is really happened with the, 
with the structure that control the seismicity. Because, for example, I don't uh, explain, but before of the GK earthquake, the, the largest foreshock was, was a magnitude 6.7, and this foreshock uh, didn't happen in the interplate zone. This happened is a crustal event that happened in the South America plate. And then this structure we don't understand very well at this moment because we all, all our stations are inland. And obviously with the an onshore deployment, we can improve all these uh, kind of the structure that are controlled the seismicity. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a clarification? Cindy, was, okay. is this also relevant to this? It was, it was, Sergio, I, a couple of years ago, there was a discussion about a cabled observatory. Is that yes. discussion still going on or is that, is that not happening? I think that this discussion is open uh, now. Uh, the, actually, the, it's Sergio Barrientos, the director of a National Seismological Center, that is uh, in, uh, moving this, uh, this idea. But I'm not sure that we can, uh, this uh, project prosper, because it's uh, for the Chilean politics is a little expensive. But actually, I don't know in, in what uh, step is this project, but uh, obviously it's not clear that in the, in the next few years we have an, an onshore instrumentation. Okay, thank you. Cindy, last question. I'd like to go back and comment and a couple, or just try to um, ask Paul and Emily to elaborate a little bit more. Uh, and somewhat implicit in, the, in your uh, presentations were the need for additional physics-based modeling of behavior, not necessarily, or, sorry, um, a new potential for um, additional components of the fault slip behavior with the fluid driving uh, forces that Emily was talking about, the, the experimental work by the French group, uh, I can't remember the, the authors. And then, uh, Paul, you were also talking about some additional um, physics based modeling. And that hasn't been, you know, we have a lot of instrumentation, but could you comment about the way that we're approaching and maybe the potential need for additional um, theory studies as well? Both Emily and Paul. Well, from my point of view, it was we, if we believe this is real, then what the heck is going on? And so we would have been racking our brains trying to see if there was a plausible physical model. In around the time, um, developments in modeling had, and sort of understanding that was really originally motivated by laboratory experiments showed that uh, if you have strong dynamic weakening during earthquakes, you can rupture into areas that are nominally Know, steady state velocity strengthening and then weight and state complex. <coughs> so you have to have weakening friction where earthquakes nucleate, but if you have strong dynamic weakening, you can have earthquakes where the, that uh, behavior at slow slip speeds is very different. And there was a talk by uh, Nadia's group, Nadia Lapusta's group at AGU that, that um, Andreas and I were sitting in, and they talked about having earthquakes rupture down into the nominally stable zone in the San Andreas. And we both looked at each other and thought, hmm, I wonder if that could explain what we see. So we've been sort of pushing that and trying to see if that was viable. And we can make models, as I showed you, we can make models that fit the data, but they require rather, at least if we believe the old accelerations, rather extreme rates of shrinking of the asperities to the point that I just strains my credibility. So now that we have uh, you know, two new independent sets of analyses, we go back and we want to relook at that and sort of see what, get a better estimate of the range of uncertainties, but it's really driven by the data. This isn't, this isn't something that we predicted and went out to try to find. It was the data that just caused us to have to go down this path. I I think I'd like to add a couple of things to that. Um, Can you come closer to the? Sure. Um, so yeah, this is an observational problem. Obviously, precursors is an observational problem. Um, the theoretical framework we have to work with, um, as Paul sort of implicitly said, is this rated state friction framework. 
And it's kind of problematic that we have just this one framework that we're working in. Um, there are, you know, rated state in the form that it is commonly applied actually does not match all known laboratory data. Um, and it, um, moreover, a lot of what we end up appealing to to explain these uh, phenomenon is, for instance, Paul was appealing to heterogeneity. And so heterogeneity is just such a garbage pail, right? <laughs> and so what do you do to get your hands around that? And I do think there are observational approaches there, and it's geology. Um, is you go out and look at rocks, and you look at rocks and you measure distribution of roughness, you measure geometry, you measure distribution of lithology, and you ask what's realistic characterization of heterogeneity, because we are really missing the mesoscale physics, and that's what I want to get at, is the mesoscale physics, which is made in state as a microscopic description, and this is a mesoscale phenomenon. And so it's a macroscopic phenomenon, but there's a meso in between. And so there, are, there is some missing physical process. There are strategies, observational strategies. I think they're somewhat different than most of what we've talked about on precursors. I do think you can make some progress through an active experiment where you, these things like Gugliami is doing, who by the way is now here at LBL. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of geology to do. Okay, so we really, we're getting yeah, behind. Yeah. We really have to. Is it really quick, Paul? Um, yeah, I just want to make one point. It, it, it doesn't contradict anything I've already said. But the, the, the paradigm that existed in Japan before 2011 is that there were seismic asperities that were fixed, and then there was creeping fault around it. That was to explain all this post seismic behavior. And what we're saying is that maybe we can't assume that those asperities are fixed. It may be very in time. What does that then say about the apparent match between the slip and where the locking was inferred? Sorry? What does that say about the apparent match of the actual co seismic slip of Tohokooki and where the locking was inferred? Oh, but you have the, you have 90 different locking models and they're all different. So I didn't. Mean, <laughs> so you think there's, there's nothing to be learned? Okay. From, right. So we're going to have to stop. <laughs> I want to. <laughs> it's your session, Cindy. <laughs> I'm sorry. We 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 because also we have people that are remote that are kind of trying to fit it into various schedules. It's but I it's just a little more. I just want to thank both of our speakers for generating such interesting and and for generating such interesting discussion. And so thank you very much.